chapter twenty six of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty six braunton burrows the weather was still as fair as could be with a light wind from the east northeast and as our course lay west by south and the ebb was running we slipped along at the rate of six or seven knots an hour though heavily laden with the colonel's rocks and after rounding porth call point we came abreast of the old scar house a little after sunset skipper jose would never have ventured inside the scar weathers only that i held the tiller and knew every vein of sand and rock and i kept so close in shore because one of the things that vexed me most in all this sudden departure was to run away without proper ceremony from bardy she was certain to feel it much and too young to perceive the necessity and fried pudding had been promised her at my table come the very next sunday the windows of the old grey mansion gleamed in the fading western light but we descried no smoke or movement neither any life or variance only a dreary pile of loneliness in the middle of yellow sands then i rigged out my perspective glass and levelled it on the cuddy chimney for the catch was a half decker to spy if the little one might so chance to be making her solitary play as she was used to do all day and most of all ere bedtime and if she should so happen i knew how wild her delight would be to discover a vessel so near the shore because whenever a sail went by even at two or three leagues of distance there was no containing her out she would rush with her face on fire and curly hair all jogging and up would go two little hands spread to the sky and the vast wide sea mammy dear aunt sa so dear papa has yet is so young ickle bother such a lot of things bardie's got to tell a and thus she would run on the brink of the waves with hope and sadness fluctuating on her unformed countenance until the sail became a speck however now i saw no token of this little rover unless it were some washed clothes flapping on the russian tufts to dry and jose called me back to my spell at the helm before i had finished gazing and in less than half an hour the landmark of the ancient house was fading in the dew fog our ship's company amounted to no less than four all hands told viz captain bethel jose alias fuzzy isaac hutchings the mate my humble self who found it my duty to supersede ikey and appoint myself and a boy of general incapacity and of the name of bang making fine weather as we did and with myself at the helm all night and taking command as my skill required we slanted across channel very sweetly and when the grey of morning broke lundy isle was on our lee bow hereupon i gave the helm to old ike for beyond this was unknown to me and providence had never led me over barnstaple bar as yet so i tumbled in and turned up no more until we were close on the bar itself about ten o'clock of the forenoon this is a thoroughly dangerous place a meeting of treacherous winds and waters in amongst uncertain shoaling and would be worse than our scar weathers if it lay open to south-west gales we waited for the tide and then slipped over very cleverly with hartland point on our starboard beam and presently we found ourselves in a fine broad open water with plenty of grey stretch going along it and green hills tufting away from it everything looked so mild and handsome that i wondered whether these men of devonshire might not be such fools for bragging after all when tested 
because when i found no means to escape this degrading voyage to devonshire i had said to myself that at any rate it would enable me to peg down those people for the future not that they boasted so to speak but that they held their tongues at our boasts as much as to say you may talk if you please it does you good and our land is such that we never need contradict you but now when i saw these ins and outs and ups and downs and cornering places and the wrinkles of the valleys and the cheeks of the very rocks set with green as bright and lively after a burning summer as our own country can show in may i began to think though i would not say it through patriotic unwillingness that the people who lived in such land as this could well afford to hold their tongues and hearken our talk with pleasure captain fuzzy said no word to show that he was home again neither did he care to ask my opinion about the look of it and old ike treating me likewise though he ought to have known much better there i found myself compelled by my natural desire to know all about my fellow-creatures to carry on what must have been a most highly flattering patronage towards the boy who did our slop-work and whose name was bang because everybody banged him this boy forgetting the respect which is due to the mate of a ship of commerce for i now assumed that position legally over the head of old ikey who acknowledged my rank when announced to him this ignorant boy had the insolence to give me a clumsy nudge and inquire do ye naw ficky part over yanner them down places and them zandy backs my boy i replied i have not the honour of knowing anything about them very likely you think a good deal of them why thee must be a born vool them be bon burruses be them indeed take this my boy for such valuable information and i gave him a cuff of an earnest nature such as he rarely obtained perhaps as well calculated to be of timely service to him he howled a good bit and attempted to kick whereupon i raised him from his natural level and made his head acquainted with the nature of the foremast preserving my temper quite admirably but bearing in mind the great importance of impressing discipline at an early age and i reaped a well-deserved reward in his lifelong gratitude and respect while bang went below to complete his weeping and to find some plaster i began to take accurate observation of these braunton burrows of which i had often heard before from the devonshire men who frequent our coast for the purpose of stealing coal or limestone an up and down sort of a place it appeared as i made it out with my spy-glass and i could not perceive that it beat our sands as those good people declared of it only i noticed that these sand-hills were of a different hue from ours not so bare and yellow-faced not so swept by western winds neither with their tops thrown up like the peak of a new volcano rushes spurge and goose-foot grasses and the rib-leafed iris and in hollow places cat's mint loose strife and low eyebright these and a thousand other plants seemed to hold the flaky surface so as not to fly like ours ike broke silence which to him was worse than breaking his own windows and said that all for leagues around was full of giants and great spectres moreover that all of it long had been found an unkind and unholy place bad for a man to walk in and swarming with great creatures striped the contrary way to all good luck and having eight legs every side and a great horn crawling after them and their food all night was known to be travellers skulls and sailors bones having seen a good deal of land crabs i scarcely dared to deny the story and yet i could hardly make it out therefore without giving vent to opinions of things which might turn out otherwise i levelled my spy-glass again at the region of which i had heard such a strange account 
and suddenly here i beheld a man of no common appearance wandering in and out the hollows as if he never meant to stop a tall man with a long grey beard and wearing a cocked hat like a colonel there was something about him that startled me and drew my whole attention therefore with my perspective glass not long ago cleaned and set shipshape by a man who understood the bearings after that rogue of a hezekiah had done his best to spoil it with this honest magnifier the only one that tells no lies i carefully followed up and down the figure some three cables lengths away of this strange walker among the sand-hills we were in smooth water now gliding gently up the river with the mainsail paying over just enough for steerage way and so i got my level truly and could follow every step it was a fine old-fashioned man tall and very upright with a broad ribbon upon his breast and something of metal shining and his hessian boots flashed now and then as he passed along with a stately stride his beard was like a streak of silver and his forehead broad and white but all the rest of his face was dark as if from foreign service his dress seemed to be of a rich black velvet very choice and costly and a long sword hung at his side although so many gentlemen now have ceased to carry even a rapier i like to see them carry their swords it shows that they can command themselves but what touched me most with feeling was his manner of going on he seemed to be searching ever searching up the hills and down the hollows through the troughs and on the breastlands in the shadow and the sunlight seeking for some precious loss after watching this figure some little time it was natural that i should grow desirous to know something more about him especially as i obtained an idea in spite of the distance and different dress that i had seen some one like this gentleman not such a very long time ago but i could not recall to my mind who it was that was hovering on the skirts of it therefore i looked around for help ike hutchings my undermate was at the tiller but i durst not lend him my glass because he knew not one end from the other so i shouted aloud for captain jose and begged him to take a good look and tell me everything that he knew or thought he just set his eye and then shut up the glass and handed it to me without a word and walked off as if i were nobody this vexed me so that i hollowed out our all of you gone downright mad on this side of the channel can't a man ask a civil question and get a civil answer when he axeth what consarneth him was the only answer captain fuzzy vouchsafed me over his shoulder i could not find it worth my while to quarrel with this ignorant man for the sake of a foolish word or two considering how morose he was and kept the keys of everything for the moment i could not help regretting my wholesome chastisement of the boy bang for he would have told me at least all he knew if i could have taught him to take a good look and as for ike when i went and tried him whether it was that he failed of my meaning or that he chose to pretend to do so on account of my having deposed him or that he truly knew nothing at all at any rate i got nothing from him this was indeed a heavy trial it is acknowledged that we have such hearts and strength of good will to the universe and power of entering into things that not a welshman of us is there but yearns to know all that can be said about every one he has ever seen or heard or even thought of and this kind will instead of being at all repressed by discouragement increases tenfold in proportion as others manifest any unkind desire to keep themselves out of the way of it my surdy no low curiosity is this but lofty sympathy my grandfather nine generations back your wrath the celebrated bard begins perhaps his most immortal ode to a gentleman who had given him a quart of beer with this noble moral precept lift up your eyes to the castle gates and behold on how small a hinge they move 
the iron is an inch and a quarter thick the gates are an hundred and fifty feet wide and though the gates of my history are not quite so wide as that they often move on a hinge even less than an inch and a quarter in thickness though i must not be too sure of course as to the substance of bang's head however allow even two inches for it and it seems but a very trifling matter to tell as it did upon great adventures the boy was as sound as a boy need be in a couple of hours afterwards except that he had or pretended to have a kind of a buzzing in one ear and i found him so grateful for my correction that i could not bear to urge his head with inquiries for the moment to captain fuzzy i said no more if he could not see the advantage of attending to his own business but must needs go out of his way to administer public reproof to me i could only be sorry for him to ikey however i put some questions of a general tendency but from his barbarous broken english if this jargon could be called english at all the only thing i could gather was that none but true devonshire folk had a right to ask about devonshire families this might be true to a certain extent though i never have seen such a law laid down the answer however is perfectly simple if these people carry on in a manner that cannot fail to draw public attention they attack us at once on our tenderest point and tenfold so if they are our betters for what man of common sense could admit the idea of anybody setting up to be nobody therefore i felt myself quite ready to give a week's pay and victuals in that state of life to which god alone could have seen fit to call me as mate of that devonshire ketch or hoy or tub or whatever it might be four shillings and a bag of suet dumplings twice a day i would have given to understand upon the spot all about that elderly gentleman it helped me very little indeed that i kept on saying to myself this matters not tis a few hours only the moment we get to barnstaple i shall find some women the women can never help telling everything and for the most part ten times that only contradict them bravely and they have no silence left however it helped me not a little when captain fuzzy with a duck of his head tumbled up from the cuddy brimful as we saw of the dinner-time a man of my experience who has lived for six weeks on the horns of sea snails which the officers found too hard for them that time we were wrecked in the palamede what can a man of this kind feel when a trumpery coaster dares to pipe all hands to dinner however it so happened for the moment that what i felt was appetite and fuzzy who was a first-rate cook and knew seasoning without counting had brought an iron ladle up so as to save his words and yet to give us some idea soup it was of a sort that set us thinking of all the meat under it i blew upon it and tasted a drop and found that other people's business would keep till at least after dinner in the midst of dinner we came to the meeting of two fine rivers called taw and torridge and with the tide still making strong we slanted up the former the channel was given to twists and turns but the fine open valley made up for it and the wealth of land on either side sloping with green meadows gently and winding in and out with trees here were cattle as red as chestnuts running about with tails like spankers such as i never saw before but ikey gave me to understand that the colour of the earth was the cause of it and that if i lived long upon corned beef made of them whose quality no other land could create i should be turned to that hue myself at this i laughed as a sailor's yarn but after regarding him steadfastly and then gazing again at the bullocks i thought there might be some truth in it one thing i will say of these sons of devon rough they may be and short of grain and fond of their own opinions and not well up in points of law which is our very nature queer moreover in thought and word and obstinate as hedgehogs yet they show and truly have a kind desire to feed one well 
money they have no great love of spending round the corner neither will they go surety freely for any man who is free to run but victuals as they call them victuals before you have been in a house two minutes out come these and eat you must happily upon this point i was able to afford them large and increasing satisfaction having rarely enjoyed so fine a means of pleasing myself and others also for the things are good and the people too and it takes a bad man to gainsay either End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty seven a fine spectacle we brought the rose of devon to her moorings on the south side of the river about two miles short of barnstaple where a little bend and creek is and a place for barges and deadman's pill was the name of it what could a dead man want with a pill was the very first thing i asked them but they said that was no concern of theirs there were pills up and down the river for miles as well as a town called pill town the cleverest man that i came across said that it must be by reason of piles driven in where the corners were to prevent the washing and he showed me some piles or their stumps to prove it and defied all further argument for the time i was beaten until of a sudden and too late to let him know i saw like a stupid that it must be no other than our own word pwill which differs much from an english pool because it may be either dry or wet so long as it lies in a hollow and with that i fell a thinking of poor bardie and pwill tavan to be quit of remorse and to see the world i accepted old ikey's invitation to barnstaple fair for the very next day we could not begin to discharge our limestone as even that obstinate fuzzy confessed upon a sacred day like that fuzzy himself had a mind for going as we half suspected although he held his tongue about it and my under-mate told me to let him alone and see what would come of it the town is a pleasant and pretty one and has always been famous for thinking itself more noble than any other also the fair was a fine thing to see full of people and full of noise and most outrageous dialect everybody in fine broad humour and no fighting worth even looking at this disappointed me for in wales we consider the off-day market a poor one unless at least some of the women pull caps i tried however not to miss it having seen in foreign countries people meeting peaceably of this i could have had no intention to complain to poor ikey hutchings however he took it as if i had and offered to find me a man from bratton or himself to have a square with me and stake half a crown upon it he must have found early cause for repentance if i had taken him at his word but every one would have cried shame upon me against such a poor little fellow and so we pushed on and the people pushed us after a little more of this and ikey bragging all the time though i saw nothing very wonderful we turned the corner of a narrow street and opened into a broader one here there seemed to be no bullocks such as had made us keep springs on our cables but a very amazing lot of horses trotting about and parading and rushing most of them with their tails up hoisted as if by discharging tackle among them stood men making much of their virtues and sinking their faults if they had any and cracking a whip every now and then with a style of applause toward them now i have a natural love of the horse though i never served long on board of one and i regularly feel at sight of them a desire to mount the rigging 
many a time i have reasoned to my own conviction and my neighbours that a man who can stand on the mizzen-top gallant yard in a heavy gale of wind must find it a ridiculously easy thing to hold on by a horse with the tackle to help him and very likely a dead calm all round nevertheless somehow or other the result seems always otherwise i had just hailed a man with a colt to show off and commodore's pendants all over his tail and was keeping clear of his counter to catch the rise of the wave for boarding him when a hush came over all hands as if the street had been raked with chain-shot and on both sides of the street all people fell back and backed their horses so that all the roadway stood as clear as if the fair had turned into a sunday morning up the centre and heeding the people no more than they would two rows of trees came two grave gentlemen daintily walking arm in arm and dressed in black they had broad flapped hats long coats of broad cloth black silk tunics and buckled breeches and black polished boots reaching up to the buckles meanwhile all the people stood huddled together upon the pitch stones on either side touching their hats and scarce whispering and even the showing off of the horses went into the side streets after all the bowing and legging that i had beheld in the royal navy the double file the noble salutes the manning of the sides and yards the drums the oars all upon the catch and all the other glorious things that fit us to thrash the frenchmen so there was nothing else left for me to suppose but that here were two mighty admirals gone into mourning very likely for the loss of the royal george or come on the sly perhaps to enjoy the rollicking of the fair and sinking the uniform for variety how could i tell and least of all would i think of interfering with the pleasure of my betters therefore i stopped in my throat the cheer which naturally seemed to rise the moment i took my hat off for fear of letting the common people know that i understood their honours but after looking again so long as one might without being inquisitive i saw that neither of these great men could walk the deck in a rolling sea i have been so bold in the thick of the horses that ikey had found it too much for him always to keep close to me but now as the nearest horse must have drifted the length of two jolly boats away this little sailor came up and spoke can he show the likes of they two in taffy land o taffy now plenty i should hope said i though proud in the end to say not one but what a fuss you make who are they as if thee didn't know cried ikey staring with indignation at me how should i know when i never clapped eyes on either of them till this moment thou hast crossed the water for something then davy them be the two passons two passons i could not say it exactly as he sounded it i never heard of two passons a wants to drive me mad a do said ikey in self-commune did he never hear tell a passin chown and passin jack man alive now it was hopeless to try any more with him for i could not ding into his stupid head the possibility of such ignorance he could only believe that i feigned it for the purpose of driving him out of his senses or making little of his native land so i felt that the best thing i could do was to look at those two great gentlemen accurately and impartially and thus form my own opinion hence there was prospect of further pleasure in coming to know more about them verily they were goodly men so far as the outer frame goes the one for size and strength and stature and the other for face form and quickness i felt as surely as men do feel who have dealed much among other men that i was gazing upon two faces not of the common order and they walked as if they knew themselves to be ever so far from the average 
not so much with pride or conceit or any sort of arrogance but with a manner of going distinct from the going of fellow-creatures whether this may have been so because they were both going straight to the devil is a question that never crossed my mind until i knew more about them for our parsons in wales take them all in all can hardly be called gentlemen except of course our own who was colonel lower's brother also the one at merthyr mar and st bride's and one or two other places where they were customers of mine but most of the rest were small farmers sons or shopkeepers boys and so on these may do very well for a parish or even a congregation that never sees a gentleman except when they are summoned and not always then however this sort will not do for a man who has served ay and been in battle under two baronets and an earl therefore i looked with some misgiving at these two great parsons but it did not take me long to perceive that each of them was of good birth at least whatever his manners afterwards men who must feel themselves out of the rank when buttoned into a pulpit for reasoning with devonshire plough-tail bobs if indeed they ever did so and as for their flocks they kept dogs enough at any rate to look after them for they both kept hounds and both served their churches in true hunting fashion that is to say with a steeple-chase taking true country at full gallop over hedges and ditches and stabling the horse in the vestry all this i did not know as yet or i must have thought even more than i did concerning those two gentlemen the taller of the two was as fair and ruddy and as free of countenance as a june rose in the sunshine a man of commanding build and figure but with no other command about him and least of all that of his own self the other it was that took my gaze and held it having caught mine eyes until i forgot myself and dropped them under some superior strength for the time i knew not how i felt or what it was that vanquished me only that my spirit owned this man's to be its master whether from excess of goodness or from depth of desperate evil at the time i knew not it was the most wondrous unfathomable face that ever fellow-man fixed gaze upon lost to mankindliness lost to mercy lost to all memory of god as handsome a face as need be seen with a very strong forehead and coal-black eyes a straight white nose and a sharp-cut mouth and the chin like a marble sculpture disdain was the first thing it gave one to think of and after that cold relentless humour and after that anything dark and bad meanwhile this was a very handsome man as women reckon beauty and his age not over forty perhaps also of good average stature active and elegant form and so on neither years nor cubits makes much odds to a man of that sort and the ladies pronounce him perfect when these two were gone by i was able to gaze again at the taller one truly a goodly man he was though spared from being a good one he seemed to stand over me like sir philip although i was measured for six feet and one inch before i got into rheumatic ways and as for size and compass my parents never could give me food to fetch out my girth as this parson's was he looked a good yard and a half round the chest and his arms were like oak saplings however he proved to be a man void of some pride and some evil desires unless anybody bore hard on him and as for reading the collects or lessons or even the burial service i was told that no man in the british realm was fit to say amen to him this had something to do with the size of his chest and perhaps might have helped to increase it his sermons also were done in a style that women would come many miles to enjoy beginning very soft and sweet so as to melt the milder ones and then of a sudden roaring greatly with all the contents of enormous lungs so as to ring all round the size of the strongest weaker vessels and as for the men what could they think when the preacher could drub any six of them 
this was parson jack if you please his surname being rambone as i need not say unless i write for unborn generations his business in bountport street that day was to see if any man could challenge him he had held the belt seven years they said for wrestling as well as for bruising the condition whereof was to walk the street both at barnstable fair and at bodmin revels and watch whether any man laid foot across him this he did purely as a layman might but the boxing and bruising were part of his office so that he hung up his cassock always for a challenge to make rent in it there had been some talk of a cornishman interfering about the wrestling and bad people hoped that he might so attempt and never know the way home again but as for the fighting the cassock might hang till the beard of parson jack was grey before any one made a hole in it also the cornish wrestler found after looking at parson jack that the wisest plan before him was to challenge the other cornish men and leave the belt in devonshire all this i found out at a little gathering which was held round the corner in bear street to reflect upon the business done at the fair and compare opinions and although i had never beheld till then any of our good company neither expected to see them again there were no two opinions about my being the most agreeable man in the room i showed them how to make punch to begin with as had been done by his royal highness with me to declare proportions and as many of the farmers had turned some money they bade me think twice about no ingredient that would figure on the bill even half a crown by right of superior knowledge and also as principal guest of the evening i became voted the chairman upon the clear understanding that i would do them the honour of paying nothing and therein i found not a man that would think of evading his duty towards the chair i entreated them all to be frank and regard me as if i were born in barnstaple which they might look upon as being done otherwise as the mere turn of a shaving for my father had been there twice and my mother more than once thought of trying it everybody saw the force of this and after a very fine supper we grew as genial as could be and leading them all with a delicate knowledge of the ins and outs of these natives many of which i had learned at the fair and especially by encouraging their bent for contradiction i heard a good deal of the leading people in the town or out of it i listened of course to a very great deal which might be of use to me or might not but my object was when i could gather in their many elbowed stories to be thoroughly up to the mark on three points first about fuzzy and most important who was he what was he where did he live had he got a wife and if so why and if not more especially why again also how much money had he and what in the world did he do with it and could he have under the rose any reason for keeping our women so distant particularly i had orders to know whether he was considered handsome by the devonshire women for our women could not make up their minds and feared to give way to the high opinion engendered by his contempt of them only they liked his general hairiness if it could be warranted not to come off upon this point i learned nothing at all no man even knew bethel jose or at any rate none would own to it perhaps because ikey was there to hearken so i left that until i should get with the women my next matter was about braunton burrows and the gentlemen of high rank who wandered up and down without telling us why and i might hereupon have won some knowledge and was beginning to do so when a square stout man came in and said hush and i would gladly have thrown a jug at him nevertheless i did learn something which i mean to tell next to directly but as concerned the third question before me and to myself the most itching of any satisfaction to at least half measure was by proper skill and fortune brought within my reach almost and this i must set down at leisure soberly thinking over it End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information 
or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty eight something about him it was of course not parson rambone but the parson chown who aroused my desire of knowledge so strongly and even here i was met at first by failure and disappointment the men would only shake their hands and say ah he is a queer one or well well we can't expect all folk to be alike you know or even some of the ruder spirits you had better go yourself and ask him a most absurd suggestion for never yet had i seen a man less fit to encourage impertinence far more ready would i have been to displease even his great comrade the rev john rambone and no one who saw them together could doubt which of the two was the master my true course was clearly to bide my time and as chairman to enhance the goodwill and geniality of the evening and this i was ready enough to do i and in the vein for it bearing in mind the wisdom of enjoying to the utmost such favourable circumstances to be on the free boot and well received in a place entirely new to me where i found myself so much ahead of everybody in matter of mind and some of them glad to acknowledge it also where no customer could be waiting to reproach me nor even a justice of the peace well versed in my countenance moreover blessed as i was with a sense of pity for these natives and a largeness of goodwill to them such a chance had never crossed me since the day my wife did ikey and i had a good laugh also at that surly bethel jose who had shown himself so much above the fair in mind yet was there in body none but bang the boy had been left for captain and crew of the rose of devon and before it was dark we had found bang shooting at four shots a penny for cocoa-nut slices with ginger beer poured over them now fortune stood my friend that night for before we began to find ourselves in a condition at all uproarious i managed to loosen the tongues of these natives by means of some excellent stories recalling the fame of my grandfather that long david llewellyn who made on his harp three unconquered ballads and won the first prize at all the eisteddfods held during his life for englynion i could not accept it as my business to play second fiddle therefore being in a happy mood i was enabled to recount such stories as made these devonshire folk open their mouths like a man at a great rock oyster while their experience was in contention with faith and perhaps good manners and as their nature is obstinate and most unwilling to be outdone they found themselves driven down at last to tell the most wonderful things they knew or else to be almost nobodies and putting aside what their grandfathers might have seen or heard or even done which is a mistake to dwell upon all their stories worth curve of the ear were of parson chown and no other for this man was a man as we say no other man must have a will that stood across the path of his if he heard of any one unwilling to give way to him he would not go to bed until he had taken that arrogance out of him many people and even some of ten times his own fortune had done their best one after the other not to be beaten by him all of them found that they could not do it and that their only chance of comfort was to knock under to parson chown and even after that had been done he was not always satisfied but let them know from time to time their folly in offending him and most of all he made a point as was natural perhaps of keeping the lord bishop of the country under him some of these had done their best before they understood him to make his habits hold themselves within some stretch of discipline or if that could not be hoped at any rate to keep silent when he heard of these ideas he was not a little pleased because he descried a rare chance of sport and he followed it up with their lordships the law he knew to its lowest tittle and while he broke it every day himself woe to any man who dared to break it against him 
and gradually these bishops came one after the other growing a little alive to what the parsons were not so much to let him alone as to desire his acquaintance out of school if so i may put it in my ignorance of the bench of bishops for well as i know a fish called the pope and also a pear said to be bishop's thumb not to mention a grass called timothy it has not been my luck thus far to rise above the bench of magistrates let be is the wisest thing one can say and so everybody said of him so soon as ever it was acknowledged that he could never be put down and thus he might have done well enough if he would have been content with this only it never was his nature to be content with anything which is the only true way to get on if any one cares for that sort of thing who knows mankind's great randomness because the one who shoves and swears without being too particular has the best chance to hoist himself upon the backs of the humble by dint of this and to keep him quiet parson chowne himself they said might have been bishop if so he had chosen for this he had some fine qualifications for his very choicest pleasure was found in tormenting his fellow parsons and a man of so bold a mind he was that he believed in nothing except himself even his own servants never knew how to come nigh him one at the stables would touch his hat and he would kick him for reply then another would come without ceremony and he knocked him down to learn it also in the house the maidens had the same account to give however much they might think of themselves and adorn themselves to that estimate he never was known to do so much as to chuck any one of them under the chin as they had been at all other places much in the habit of feeling neither did he make a joke to excuse himself for omitting it as to that they would scorn themselves ever to think of permitting it being young women of high respect and quite aware how to conduct themselves but they might have liked to stop him and they got no chance of doing it all this small talk almost vexed me more than the content it gave every now and then i could see the man in these little corner views but they did not show me round him so as to get his girth and substance think of the devil is an old saying and while i thought of him in he walked at the very first glimpse of him all those people who had been talking so freely about him shrank away and said servant sir and looked so foolish more than usual then he read them with one eye he had his riding clothes on now and it made him look still sharper talking of me good people eh i hope the subject pleases you open your ranks if you please and show me whether my groom is behind you he cracked a great hunting whip as he spoke and it seemed a poor prospect for the groom wherever he might be loitering please your honour your honour's groom have not been here all day a'most and if her coomp a saunt keepin in that resolution you are wise what you hear welshman i marked you to-day you will come to me by noon to-morrow here is for your charges he threw on the table two crown pieces and was gone before i knew what answer i was bound to make to him the men recovering from his presence ran to the window to watch him as far as the flaring lights of the fair now spluttering low displayed him without being able to see so much as i strongly desired to see of him i could not help admiring now his look and his manner and strongly steady gait and the general style of his outward man his free way of going along made clear the excellence of his clothing and he swung his right elbow as i was told from his constant desire to lash a horse he was the devil himself to ride so everybody said of him and parson chowne's horse was now become a byword for any one thoroughly thrashed and yet no other man must ever dare to touch his horses if any one did no deadlier outrage could be put upon him hearing these things from fourteen customers able to express their thoughts i was sorry when the corner turned upon parson chowne so walking in the light of long deal tables set with finely guttering candles and with goods not quite sold out 
and he left upon my memory a vision of a great commander having a hat of controlling movements and a riding-coat so shaped that a horse appeared to be under it and lower down buff leathern breeches and boots well over the hinge of his legs and silver heels and silver spurs and nothing to obscure him no topcoat or outer style of means to fend the weather because he could keep it in order always i wish i was like him then said i and what does he mean by insulting me i know a hundred bigger fellows am i at his beck and call i warrant thou wilt be zoon enough answered with a heavy grin a lout of a fellow who had shown no more sense than to leave the room at the very crash and crown of one of my best stories hast heerd what passen have now a dude he was come in primed with some rubbishing tale and wanted the room to make much of him nevertheless the men of perception had not done with me yet whatever be un whatever be un spack up oslo jan cried some of the altogether younger men who never know good work from bad but seek some new astonishment goodness knows how hard it was and how wholly undeserved for me to withdraw and let them talk only because their news was newer and about a favourite man to talk of however i pressed down my feelings not being certain about my bill if i offended any one for mercy's sake i spare their brogue and tell their story decently an ostler john's tale was as follows so far as i could make it out by means of good luck and by watching his face a certain justice of the peace whose name was captain vellicott a gentleman of spirit who lived in one of the parishes belonging to this parson chown who happened to have two churches this gentleman had contrived to give as almost every one managed to do deadly offence to parson chown it was expected that the parson would be content to have him down and horsewhip him as his manner was and burn his house down afterwards but the people who thought this were too hasty and understood not his reverence whether from dislike of sitting upon the bench with him afterwards or whether because mrs vellicott also had dared to shake hands with her gauntlet on or because the baby cried when offered up to kiss the parson at any rate captain vellicott must have more than a simple chastisement the captain being a quick sharp man who said a hot word and forgot it laughed at every one who told him to see to himself and so on the parson said he is a man of his cloth so am i of mine and i will not insult him by expecting insult so it came to pass that he made the mistake of measuring another man by his own measure after a few months this gentleman felt that the parson had quite forgiven him no evil having befallen him yet except that his rickyard had twice been fired and his wife insulted by the naked people whom chown maintained upon nympton moor and so when they met in the fair this day the captain bowed to the parson and meant to go on and see to his business but the other would not have it so he offered his hand most cordially and asked how mrs vellicott was and all the five children according to ages using the christian name of each captain vellicott was so pleased by the kindness of his memory and the nobility shown in dropping whatever had been between them that what did he do but invite master chowne to dine with him up at the fortescue arms hotel and see a young horse he had bought in the fair giving his own for it and five guineas for he was not a rich man at all and was come to make a moderate bargain everything might have gone on well and perhaps the parson really meant to forgive him at the moment for having dared in the bygone matter to have a will of his own almost but as bad luck would have it this very horse that the captain had bought turned out to be one which the parson had eye upon ever since last year's hunting season however not to paint the devil too black it was confessed that he offered vellicott five pounds for his bargain this ought to have satisfied any man who knew what parson chowne was and that fifty times five pounds would be saved by keeping out of his black books 
nevertheless the captain stuck to his bargain and ruined himself the two gentlemen parted very good friends shaking hands warmly and having their joke and hoping to dine again soon together for parson chowne could beat all the world at after-dinner stories and the captain was the best man to laugh anywhere round the neighbourhood and so he started rather early on purpose to show his new horse to his wife but the ostler who was a very old codger and had seen a little of parson's ways shook his head after the captain's shilling and spat upon it to prevent bad luck and laid it on the shelf where he kept his blacking he was too clever to say one word but every one remembered how he had behaved and the sigh he gave when he reminded them it may have been half an hour afterwards or it may have been an hour and a half so much these people differed when captain vellicott on a hurdle came to surgeon cutcliffe's door and the horse was led to farrier gould who sent him to the mayor for opinions and his worship sent him on to pilch of the knacker's yard poor justice vellicott's collar-bone was snapped in two places and his left thigh broken also three of his ribs stoven in and a good deal of breakage abroad in his head however they hoped that he might come round and being a devonshire man he did as i found out afterwards this tale which ostler john delivered at ten times the length of the above caused a very great stir and excitement and comparison of opinions and when these wiseacres had almost exhausted their powers of wonder i desired to know in the name of goodness why the poor parson must be saddled with every man who fell off his horse in the first place he must have been far away from the scene of the misfortune inasmuch as no more than an hour ago he was seeking his groom amongst us and again what could be more likely than that captain vellicott might have taken with a view to good luck for his purchase a bottle or two of wine beyond what otherwise would have contented him and even if not why a horse might fall much more a man who has only two legs without anybody having designed it this reasoning of mine made no impression because everybody's opinion was set passant chowne had a dude it they scratched their heads and went into side questions but on the main point all agreed twar aether the passon or the devil himsel end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty nine a visit to a parson my opinion of devonshire now grew fast that most of the people are mad there honest respectable very kind-hearted shrewd at a bargain yet trustful simple manly and outspoken nevertheless they must be mad to keep parson chowne among them but here as in one or two other matters i found myself long ere i finished with it if a man visits a strange country he ought to take time to think about it and not judge the natives by first appearance however superior he may be this i felt even then and tried my very best to act up to it nevertheless it came back on me always that in the large county of devon there were only two sound people parson chowne for the one and of course for the other davy llewellyn so i resolved to see this thing out especially as when i came to think nothing could be clearer than that the parson himself had descried and taken me with his wonderful quickness for the only intelligent man to be found how he knew me to be a welshman i could not tell then and am not sure now it must have been because i looked so superior to the rest of them i gazed at the two crown pieces when i came to be active again the next day and finding them both very good i determined to keep them and go to see after some more 
but if i thought to have got the right side of the bargain so far as the money went i reckoned amiss considerably for i found that the parson lived so far away that i could not walk thither and back again without being footsore for a week and captain fuzzy would not allow it especially as he had bound me to help in discharging cargo and being quite ignorant as to the road to hire a horse would not avail me even supposing i could stay on board of him which was against all experience and by the time i had hired a cart to take me to nympton on the moors as well as a hand to pilot her behold i was on the wrong side of my two crowns without any allowance for rations they told me that everybody always charged double price for going up to the parson's and even so did not care for the job much because though it was possible to come back safe there was a poor chance of doing so without some damage to man or beast and perhaps to the vehicle also hereupon i had a great mind not to go but being assured upon all sides that this would be a most dangerous thing as well as supported perhaps by my native resolution and habits of inquiry i nailed my colours to the mast and mounted the cart by the larboard slings it was a long and tiresome journey quite up into a wilderness and for the latter part of it the track could not have been found except by means of a rough stone flung down here and there but the driver told me that parson chowne took the whole of it three times a week at a gallop not being able to live without more harm than this lonely place afforded finding this fellow more ahead of his wits than most of those devonshire yokels are i beguiled the long journey by letting him talk and now and then putting a question to him he was full of course like all the town of poor captain vellicott's misadventure and the terrible spell put upon his new horse which had seemed in the morning so quiet and docile this he pretended at first to explain as the result of a compact formed some years back between his reverence and the devil for parson chowne had thoroughly startled and robbed the latter of all self-esteem until he had given in and contracted to be at his beck and call like a good servant until it should come to the settlement and poor parson jack was to be thrown in though not such a very bad man sometimes it being thoroughly understood though not expressed between them that parson chowne was to lead him on step by step with his own pilgrimage all this i listened to very quietly scarce knowing what to say about it however i asked the driver as a man having intimate knowledge of horses whether he really did believe that they like the swine of the gadarenes were laid open to infection from even a man with seven devils in him and the more so as these had been never cast out according to all that appeared of him at this he cracked his whip and thought not being much at theology and not having met it may be until now a man so thoroughly versed in it i gave him his time to consider it out but the trouble seemed only to grow on him until he laid down his whip and said not being able to do any more horses is horses and pigs is pigs every bit the same as men be men if the lord made em both the devil had the right to take em both this was so sound in point of reasoning as well as of what we do here in church that never another word could i say being taken in my own shallowness and this is the only thing that can happen to a fellow too fond of objections however the driver perceiving now that he had been too much for me was pleased with me and became disposed to make it up by a freedom of further information if i were to put this in his own words who could make head or tail of it and indeed i could not stoop my pen to write such outlandish language he said that his cousin was the very same knacker who had slaughtered that poor horse last night to put it out of misery having an order from the mayor put this here 
hannimal to death he did it and thought no more about it until he got up in the morning then as no boiling was yet on hand he went to look at this fine young horse whose time had been so hastened and the brains being always so valuable for mixing with fresh but i will not tell for the sake of honour it was natural that he should look at the head of this poor creature finding the eyes in a strange condition he examined them carefully and lifting the lids and probing round in each he found a berry my coachman said that his cousin now took these two berries which he had thus discovered out of a new horn-box in which he had placed them for certainty and asked him to make out what they were the knacker for his part believed that they came from a creeping plant called the bittersweet nightshade or sometimes the lady's necklace but his cousin my coachman thought otherwise he had wandered a good deal about in the fields before he married his young woman and there he had seen in autumnal days the very same things as had killed the poor horse a red thing that sticks in a cloven pod much harder than berries of nightshade and likely to keep in its poison until the moisture and warmth should dissolve its skin i knew what he meant after thinking a while because when a child i had gathered them it is the seed of a nasty flag which some call the roast beef plant and others the stinking iris these poisonous things in the eyes of a horse cleverly pushed in under the lids heating and melting according as the heating and working of muscles crushed them then shooting their red fire over the agonized tissues of eyeballs what horse would not have gone mad with it also finding so rare a chance of a devonshire man who was not dumb i took opportunity of going into the matter of that fine old gentleman whose strange and unreasonable habit of seeking among those braunton burrows as if for somebody buried there had almost broken my rest ever since till i stumbled on yet greater wonders coachman however knew nothing about it or else was not going to tell too much and took a sudden turn of beginning to think that i asked too many questions without even an inn to stand treat at and perhaps he found out with the jerks of the cart that i had a very small phial of rum not enough for two people to think of he may have been bidding for that with his news if so he made a great mistake not that i ever grudge anything only that there was not half enough for myself under the trying circumstances and the man should have shown better manners than ever to cast even half an eye on it at last we were forced on the brow of a hill to come to a mooring in a fine old ditch not having even a wall or a tree or a rick of peat to shelter us and half a mile away round the corner might be found as the driver said the rectory house of parson chowne neither horse nor man would budge so much as a yard more in that direction and it took a great deal to make them promise to wait there till two of the clock for me but i had sense enough to pay nothing until they should carry me home again still i could not feel quite sure how far their courage would hold out in a lonely place and so unkind and even with all that i feel within me of royal blood from royal bards which must be the highest form of it i did not feel myself so wholly comfortable and relishing as my duty is towards dinner-time nevertheless i plucked up courage and went round the corner here i found a sort of a road with fir-trees on each side of it all blown one way by strong storms and unable to get back again the road lay not in a hollow exactly but in a shallow trough of the hills which these fir-trees were meant to fill up if the wind would allow them occasion and going between them i felt the want of the pole i had left behind me and if i had happened to own a gold watch or anything fit to breed enemies the knowledge of my price would have kept me from such temptation of providence 
a tremendous roaring of dogs broke upon me the moment i got the first glimpse of the house and this obliged me to go on carefully because of that race i have had too much and never found them mannersome one huge fellow rushed up to me and disturbed my mind to so great a degree that i was unable to take heed of anything about the place except his savage eyes and highly alarming expression and manner for he kept on showing his horrible tusks and growling a deep growl broken with snarls and sidling to and fro so as to get the better chance of a dash at me and i durst not take my eyes from his or his fangs would have been in my throat at a spring i called him every endearing name that i could lay my tongue to and lavished upon him such admiration as might have melted the sternest heart but he placed no faith in a word of it and nothing except my determined gaze kept him at bay for a moment therefore i felt for my sailor's knife which luckily hung by a string from my belt and if he had leaped at me he would have had it as sure as my name is llewellyn and few men i think would find fault with me for doing my best to defend myself however one man did for a stern voice cried shut your knife you scoundrel poor sammy did the villain threaten you sammy crouched and fawned and whimpered and went on his belly to lick his master while i wiped the perspiration of my fright beneath my hat this is a nice way to begin said chowne after giving his dog a kick to come here and draw a knife on my very best dog go down on your knees sir and beg sammy's pardon may it please your reverence i replied in spite of his eyes which lay fiercer upon me than even those of the dog had done i would have cut his throat and i will if he dares to touch me that would grieve me my good welshman because i should then let loose the pack and we might have to bury you however no more of this trifle go in to my housekeeper and recover your nerves a little and in half an hour come to my study i touched my hat and obeyed his order following the track which he pointed out but keeping still ready for action if any more dog should bear down on me however i met no creature worse than a very morose old woman who merely grunted in reply to the very best flourish i could contrive and led me into a long low kitchen dinner time for the common people being now at maturity i expected to see all the servants of course and to smell something decent and gratifying however there was no such luck only without even asking my taste she gave me a small jug of sour ale and the bottom of a loaf and a bit of dutch cheese of course this was good enough for me and having an appetite after the ride i felt truly grateful however i could not help feeling also that in the cupboard just over my elbow there lay a fillet of fine spiced beef to which i have always been partial and after the perils i had encountered the least she could do was to offer it down anywhere else i might have taken the liberty of suggesting this but in that house i durst not further than to ask very delicately madam it is early for great people but has his reverence been pleased to dine did he give you leave to ask sir no i cannot say that he did i meant no offence but only i mean no offence but only you must be a stranger to think of asking a question in this house without his leave nothing could have been said to me more thoroughly grievous and oppressive and she offered no line or opening for me to begin again as cross women generally do by not being satisfied with their sting so i made the best of my bread and cheese and thought that scar house was a paradise compared to nympton rectory it is time for you now to go to my master she broke in with her cold harsh voice before i had scraped all the rind of my cheese and when i was looking for more sour beer very well i replied there is no temptation of any sort madam to linger here 
she smiled for the first time a very tart smile even worse than the flavour of that shrewd ale but without its weakness and then she pointed up some steps and along a stone passage and said exactly as if she took me for no more than a common tramp at the end of that passage turn to the left and knock at the third door round the corner you dare not lay hands on anything my master will know it if you do this was a little too much for me after all the insults i had now put up with i turned and gazed full on her strange square face and into the depth of her narrow black eyes with a glimpse of the window showing them your master i said your son you mean and much there is to choose between you she did not betray any signs of surprise at this haphazard shot of mine but coldly answered my gaze and said you are very insolent let me give you a warning you seem to be a powerful man in the hands of my master you would be a babe although you are so much larger and were i to tell him what you have said there would not be a sound piece of skin on you now let me hear no more of you with the greatest pleasure madam i am sure i can't understand whatever could bring me here but i can she answered more to her own thoughts than to mine as she shut the door quite on my heels and left me to my own devices i felt almost as much amiss as if i were in an evil dream of being chased through caves of rock by some of my very best customers all bearing red-hot toasting forks and pelting me with my own good fish it is the very worst dream i have and it never comes after a common supper which proves how clear my conscience is and even now i might have escaped because there were side passages and for a minute i stood in doubt until there came into my mind the tales of the pack of hounds he kept and two or three people torn to pieces and nobody daring to interfere also i wanted to see him again for he beat everybody i had ever seen and i longed to be able to describe him to a civilized audience at the jolly sailors therefore i knocked at the door of his room approaching it very carefully and thanking the lord for his last great mercy in having put my knife into my head you may come in was the answer i got at last and so in i went and a queerer room i never did go into but wonderful as the room was surely and leaving no memory a shade of half-seen wonders afterwards for the time i had no power to look at anything but the man people may laugh and they always do until they gain experience at the idea of one man binding other men prisoners to his will for all their laughing there stands the truth and the men who resist such influence best are those who do not laugh at it i have seen too much of the tricks of the world to believe in anything supernatural but the granting of this power is most strictly within nature's scope and somebody must have it one man has the gift of love that everybody loves him another has the gift of hate that nobody comes near him the third and far the rarest gift combines the two others one more one less and adds to them both the gift of fear i felt as i tried to meet his gaze and found my eyes quiver away from it that the further i kept from this man's sight the better it would be for me he sat in a high-backed chair and pointed to a three-legged stool as much as to say you may even sit down this i did and waited for him your name is david llewellyn he said caring no more to look at me you came from the coast of glamorgan three days ago in the rose of devon schooner catch your reverence if you please the difference is in the mizzenmast well jack ketch if you like sir no more interrupting me now you will answer a few questions and if you tell me one word of falsehood he did not finish his sentence but he frightened me far more than if he had i promised to do my best to tell the truth so far as lies in me do you know what child that was that came ashore drowned upon your coast when the coroner made such a fool of himself and the jury as well your reverence about the child i know nothing at all 
describe that child to the best of your power for you are not altogether a fool i told him what the poor babe was like so far as i could remember it but something holy and harmless kept me from saying one word about bardie and to the last day of my life i shall rejoice that i so behaved he saw that i was speaking truth but he showed no signs of joy or sorrow until i ventured to put in may i ask why your reverence wishes to know and what you think of this matter and how certainly you may ask llewellyn it is a woman's and a welshman's privilege but certainly you shall have no reply what inquiry has been made along your coast about this affair i longed to answer him in my humour even as he had answered me with any one else i could have done it but i durst not so with him therefore i told him all the truth to the utmost of my knowledge making no secret of hezekiah and his low curiosity also the man of the press with the hat and then i could not quite leave out the visit of anthony stew and sir philip this more than anything else aroused parson chowne's attention for the papers he cared not a damn he said for two of them lived by abusing him but as he swore not except that once it appeared to me that he did care however he pressed me most close and hard about anthony stew and sir philip when he had got from me all that i knew except that he never once hit upon bardie the heart and the jewel of everything he asked me without any warning do you know who that sir philip is no your reverence i have not even heard so much as his surname although no doubt i shall find out you fool is that all the wit you have three days in and out of barnstaple it is sir philip bampfylde of narnton court close by you there is no narnton court that i know of your reverence anywhere round our neighbourhood there's candleston court and court isa and court tush i mean near where your ship is lying and that is chiefly what i want with you i know men well and i know that you are a man that will do anything for money my breath was taken away at this so far was it from my true character i like money well enough in its way but as for a single disgraceful action your reverence never made such a mistake for coming up here i have even paid more than you were pleased to give me if that is your point i will go straight back do anything indeed for money pooh this is excellent indignation what man is there but will do so i mean of course anything you consider to be right and virtuous anything which is undeniably right and upright and virtuous ah now your reverence understands me such has always been my character in your own opinion well self-respect is a real blessing i will not ask you to forego it your business will be of a nature congenial as well as interesting to you your ship lies just in the right position for the service i require and as she is known to have come from wales no revenue men will trouble you you will have to keep watch both day and night upon sir philip and narnton court nothing in the nature of spying your reverence or sneaking after servants or underhand work nothing at all of that sort you have nothing to do but to use your eyes upon the river front of the building especially the landing-place you will come and tell me as soon as ever you see any kind of boat or vessel either come to or leave the landing-place also if any man with a trumpet hails either boat or vessel in short any kind of communication betwixt narnton court and the river you need not take any trouble except when the tide is up the river am i to do this against sir philip who has been so kind and good to me if so i will hear no more of it not so it is for sir philip's good he is in danger and very obstinate he stupidly meddles with politics my object is to save him 
i see what your reverence means i answered being greatly relieved by this for then and even to this day i believe many of the ancient families were not content with his gracious majesty but hankered after ungracious stuarts mainly because they could not get them i will do my best to oblige you sir i finished and made a bow to him to obey me you mean of course you will but remember one thing you are not to dare to ask a single word about this family or even mention sir philip's name to anybody except myself i have good reason for this order if you break it i shall know it and turn you to stone immediately you are aware that i possess that power please your reverence i have heard so and i would gladly see it done not to myself as yet but rather to that old woman in the kitchen it could not make much difference to her keep your position sir he answered in a tone which frightened me it was not violent but so deep and now for your scale of wages of course being opposite that old house you would watch it without my, any orders the only trouble i give you is this when the tide runs up after dark and smooth water lets vessels over the bar you will have to loosen your boat or dinghy punt or whatever you call her and pull across the river and lie in a shaded corner which you will find below narnton court and commanding a view of it have you firearms then take this the stock is hollow and contains six charges you can shoot i am sure of that i know a poacher by his eyelids he gave me a heavy two-barrel pistol long enough for a gun almost and meant to be fired from the shoulder then pressing a spring in the stock he laid bare a chamber containing some ammunition as well as a couple of spare flints he was going to teach me how to load it till i told him that i had been captain of cannon and perhaps the best shot in the royal navy then don't shoot yourself he said as most of the old sailors have reason to do but now you will earn your living well what with your wages on board the schooner and the crown a week i shall give you a crown a week your reverence my countenance must have fallen sadly for i look to a guinea a week at least and to have to stay out of my bed like that it is a large sum i know llewellyn but you must do your best to earn it by diligence and alacrity i could have sent one of my fine naked fellows and of course not have paid him anything but the fools near the towns are so fidgety now that they stare at these honest adamites and talk of them which would defeat my purpose be off with you i must go and see them nothing else refreshes me after talking so long to a fellow like you here are two guineas for you one in advance for your first month's wage the other you will keep until i have done with you and then return it to me a month your honour i cried in dismay i never could stop in this country a month why a week of it would be enough to drive me out of my mind almost you will stay as long as i please llewellyn that second guinea which you pouch so promptly is to enable you to come to me by day or by night on the very moment you see anything worth reporting you are afraid of the dogs yes all rogues are here take this whistle they are trained to obey it they will crouch and fawn to you when you blow it he gave me a few more minute instructions and then showed me out by a little side door and all the way back such a weight was upon me and continual presence of strange black eyes and dread of some hovering danger that i answered the driver to never a word nor cared for any of his wondrous stories about the naked people whose huts we beheld in a valley below us nay not even though truly needing it and to my own great amazement could i manage a drop of my pittance of rum so the driver got it after all or at least whatever remained of it while i wished myself back at old newton nottage and seemed to be wrapped in an evil dream both horse and driver however found themselves not only thankful but light-hearted at getting away from nempton moor jack even sang a song when five miles off and in his clumsy way rallied me but finding this useless he said that it was no more than he had expected because it was known that it always befell every man who forgot his baptism and got into dealings with parson chowne end of chapter twenty nine
chapter thirty of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter thirty on duty there are many people who cannot enter into my meaning altogether this i have felt so often that now i may have given utterance to it once or possibly twice before if so you will find me consistent wholly and quite prepared to abide by it in all substantial things i am clearer than the noonday sun itself and to the very utmost farthing righteous and unimpeachable money i look at now and then when it comes across me and i like it well enough for the sake of the things it goes for but as for committing an action below the honour of my family and ancestors who never tuned their harps for less than a mark a night also and best of all my own conscience a power that thumps all night like a ghost if i have not strictly humoured it for me to talk of such things seems almost to degrade the whole of them therefore if any one dreams in his folly that i would play the spy upon that great house over the river i have no more to say except that he is not worthy to read my tale i regard him with contempt and loathe him for his vile insinuations such a man is only fit to take the place of a spy himself and earn perhaps something worth talking of if his interests let him talk of it for taking friendly observation of narnton court for its inmates sake i was to have just five shillings a week it became my duty now to attend to the getting out of the limestone and i fetched it up with a swing that shook every leaf of the rose of devon fuzzy attempted to govern me but i let him know that i would not have it and never knocked under to any man and if parson chowne had come alongside i would have said the same to him nevertheless as an honest man i took care to earn my money though less than the value of one good suin or at any rate of a fine turbo each week no craft of any sort went up or down that blessed river without my laying perspective on her if there chanced to be light enough or if she slipped along after dark which is not worth while to do on account of the shoals and windings there was i in our little dinghy not so far off as they might imagine and i could answer for it even with disdainful chown looking down through me that nothing larger than a row-boat could have made for narnton court but i have not said much of the river as yet and who can understand me this river bends in graceful courtesies to the sweet land it is leaving and the hills that hold its birth also with a vein of terror at the unknown sea before it back it comes when you grieve to think that it must have said good-bye for ever such a lovely winding river with so many wilful ways silvery shallows and deep rich shadows where the trees come down to drink also beautiful bright green meadows sloping to have a taste of it and the pleaches of bright sand offered to satisfy the tide and the dark points jutting out on purpose to protect it many rivers have i seen nobler grander more determined yet among them all not one that took and led my heart so had i been born on its banks or among the hills that gaze down over it what a song i would have made to it although the bardic inspiration seems to have dropped out of my generation yet will it return with fourfold vigour probably in bunny's children if she ever has any that is to say of the proper gender for the thumb of a woman is weak on the harp and bunny's only aspiration is for ribbons and lollipops which must be beaten out of her however my principal business now was not to admire this river but watch it 
and sometimes i found it uncommonly cold and would gladly have had quite an ugly river if less attractive to white frosts and what with the clearing of our cargo and the grumbling afterwards and the waiting for sailing orders and never getting any and the setting in of a sudden gale which but for me must have capsized us when her hold was empty as well as some more delays which now i cannot stop to think of the middle of october found us still made fast by stem and stern in barnstaple river at dead man's pill parson chowne who never happened to neglect a single thing that did concern his interests any more than he ever happened to forget an injury twice or thrice a week he came mounted on his coal-black mare to know what was going on with us i saw for i am pretty sharp though not pretending to vie with him as no man might who had not dealt in a wholesale mode with the devil i saw though the clumsy understrappers meant me not to notice it that bethel jose our captain was no more than a slave of the parson's this made clear to me quite a lump of what had seemed hopeless mysteries touching my poor self to begin with chowne knew all about me of course by means of this dirty fuzzy also fuzzy's silence now and the difficulty of working him with any number of sheets in the wind which had puzzled both newton and nottage and the two public-houses at porthcall and might have enabled him to marry even a farmer's widow with a rabbit worn and three hundred and fifty pounds to dispose of and a reputation for sheep's milk cheese and herself not bad-looking in spite of a beard i could see and could carry home the truth having thoroughly got to the bottom of it and might have a chance myself to settle if i dealt my secret well with some of the women who had sworn to be single until that fuzzy provoked them so this consideration added more than can be now described to my desire to get home before any one got in front of me but fuzzy from day to day pretended that the catch was not victualled to sail any more than she was even ballasted she must load with hay or with bricks or pottery or with something to fill her hold and pay freight or what was to fill our bellies all the way back and so on and so on until i was sure that he had some dark reason for lingering there of course i had not been such a pure fool in spite of short seasons for going from home as to forget my desire and need to come home after proper interval the whole of the parish would yearn for me and so would ewenny and lalliston long ere the christmas cod comes in and i made a point in my promises to be back before gunpowder treason and plot as a thoroughly ancient hand at the cannon i always led the fireworks and the pope having done something violent lately they were to be very grand this year what is a man when outside his own country a prophet a magistrate even a sailor who has kept well in with his relations all his old friends are there longing to praise him when they hear of good affairs and as to his enemies a man of my breadth of nature has none this made it dreadfully grievous for me not to be getting home again and my heart was like a sprouted onion when i thought of bardie bunny would fight on i knew and get converted to the church in the house of our churchwarden and perhaps be baptized after all which my wife never would have done to her however i did not care for that because no great harm could come of it and if the primitives gave her ribbons the church would be bound to grant honiton lace thinking of all my engagements and compacts and serious trusteeships and the many yearnings after me i told bethel jose in so many words that i was not a black man but a white man unable to be trampled on and prepared unless they could show me better to place my matter in the hands of his worship no less than the mayor of barnstaple 
fuzzy grinned and so did ike and finding the mare sitting handsomely upon the very next market-day i laid my case before him his worship as keeping a grocer's shop at which i had bought three pounds of onions and a quarter of a pound of speckled cheese and a half an ounce of tobacco was much inclined to do me justice and indeed began to do so in a loud and powerful voice and eager for people to hearken him but somebody whispered something to him containing no doubt the great parson's name and he shrank back into his hole and discharged my summons like a worm with lime laid on his tail such things are painful yet no man must insist upon them hardly because our ancestors got on among far greater hardships and it would prove us a bad low age if we turned sour about them we are the finest fellows to fight that were ever according to providence we ought to be thankful for this great privilege as i mean to show by and by and i would not shake hands with any man who for trumpery stuff would dare to make such a terrible force internal this grand soundness of my nature led me to go under orders though acquit of legal contract only seeking to do the right while receiving the money beforehand now this created a position of trust for it involved a strong confidence in one's honour any man paying me beforehand places me at a disadvantage which is hardly fair of him i do not like to refuse him because it would seem so ungraceful and yet i can never be sure but that i ought to take consideration not to dwell too much upon scruples which scarcely any one else might feel and no other man can enter into be it enough that my honour now was bound to do what was expected but what a hardship it was to be sure to find myself debarred entirely from forming acquaintance or asking questions or going into the matter in my own style especially now that my anxiety was quickened beyond bearing to get to the bottom of all these wonders about sir philip bampfylde what had led him to visit me what was he seeking on braunton burrows for now i knew that it must be he why did parson chowne desire to keep such watch on the visitors to narnton court by water while all the world might pass into or out of the house by land or did the parson keep other people watching the other side of the house and prevent me from going near them lest we should league together to cheat him this last thing seemed to be very likely and it proved to be more than that revolving all this much at leisure in the quiet churn of mind i pushed off with my little dinghy from the side of the rose of devon when the evening dusk was falling somewhere at october's end this little boat now seemed to be placed at my disposal always although there used to be such a fuss and turn for turn in taking her now the glance of light on water and the flowing shadows keeping humour with the quiet play of evening breezes here a hill and there a tree or rock to be regarded while the strong influx of sea with white wisps traced the middle channel and the little nooks withdrawn under gentle promontories took no heed of anything when the moon came over these dissipating clouds and moving sullen mists aside her track i found it uncommonly difficult to be sure what i was up to the full moon lately risen gazed directly down the river but memory of daylight still was coming from the westward feeble and inclined to yield what business was all this of mine god makes all things to have turn and i doubt if he ever meant mankind to be always spying into it ever so much better go these things without our bother and our parson said being a noble preacher and fit any day for the navy that the people who conquered the world according to the prophet joel twentieth after trinity never noticed nature never did consult the lord of hosts and yet must have contented him difficult questions of this colour must be left to parsons who beat all lawyers out and out in the matter of pure cleverness because the latter never can anyhow but the former somehow with the greatest ease reconcile all 
difficulties the only business i have to deal with is what i bodily see feel and hear and have mind to go through with and work out to perfect satisfaction and this night i found more than ever broke upon my wits before except when muzzle gapes at muzzle and to blow or be blown up depends upon a single spark because now in my quiet manner growing to be customary under parson chowne's regard dipping oars i crossed the river making slant for running tide that man knowing everybody who might suit his purpose had employed me rather than old ikey or even fuzzy partly because i could row so well and make no sound in doing it while either of them with muffled rowlocks would splash and grunt to be heard across river and halfway to barnstaple bridge almost as silently as an owl i skimmed across the silent river not with the smallest desire to spy but because the poetry of my nature came out strongly and having this upon me still i rowed my boat into a drooping tree overhanging a quiet nook here i commanded the river front of all that great house narnton court which stands on the north side of the water over against our dead man's pill after several voyages under sundry states of light and weather this was now proved to me as the very best point of observation for all the long and straggling house quite big enough for any three of the magistrates houses on our side could have been taken and raked as it were like a great ship with her stern to me from the spot where i lay hidden such a length it stretched along with little except the west end to me and a show of front windows dark and void and all along the river terrace and the narrow spread of it overlooking the bright water pagan gods or wicked things just as bad all standing however that was not my business if the gentry will forego the whole of their christianity they must answer for themselves when the proper time appears only we would let them know that we hold aloof from any breach of their commandments a flight of ten wild ducks had been seen coming up the river every now and then as well as fourteen red caps and three or four good wisps of teal having to see to my victualling now as well as for the sport of it i loaded the parson's two-foot pistol which was as good as a gun almost with three tobacco pipes full of powder poured into each barrel and then a piece of an ancient hat which ikey had worn so long that no man could distinguish it from wadding and upon the top of the hat three ounces of leaden pellets and all kept tight with a good dollop of oakum it must kill a wild duck at forty yards or a red cap up to fifty if i hit the rogues in the head at all the tide must have been pretty nigh the flood and the moon was rising hazily and all the river was pale and lonely for the brown sail lighters which they call the tauten fleet had long passed by when i heard that silvery sound of swiftness cleaving solitude the flight of a wedge of wild ducks i knelt in the very smallest form that nature would allow of and with one hand held a branch to keep the boat from surging plash they came down after two short turns as sudden as forked lightning heads down for a moment then heads up and wings flapping sousing and subsiding quacks began from the old drake first and then from the rest of the company and a racing after one another and a rapid gambolling under and between them all the river lost its smoothness beaten into ups and downs that sloped away in ridge and furrow these fine fellows as fat as butter after the barley stubble time carried on such joy and glory within twenty yards of me that i could not bring my gun to bear for quiet shot so as to settle for like an ancient gunner i bided my time being up to the tricks of most of them when their wild delight of water should begin to sate itself what would they do why gather in round the father of the family and bob their heads together this is the time to be sure of them especially with two barrels fired at once as i could easily manage 
i never felt sure of birds in my life i smelt them in the dripping pan and beheld myself quite basting them but all of a sudden up they flew when i had got three in a line and waited for two more to come into it just as the muzzle was true upon them up and away and left me nothing except to rub my eyes and swear i might have shot as they rose but something told me not to do so therefore i crept back in my little punt and waited in another moment i heard the swing of stout oars pulled with time and power such as i had not heard for years nor since myself was stroke of it of course i knew that this must be a boat of the british navy probably the captain's gig and choice young fellows rowing her and the tears sprang into my eyes at thought of all the times and things between and all the heavy falls of life since thus i clothed the waters all my heart went out towards her and i held my breath with longing as i looked between the branches of the dark and fluttering tree just to let them know that here was one who understood them End of chapter thirty